I want to welcome everybody to our um, regular Wednesday seminar in CEFS, School of Environmental and Forest Sciences, and uh, start by acknowledging that we are on the land of the um, Coast Salish peoples, the land that touches the waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And I am pleased today to welcome Jalan White Newsom to our seminar. I um, was happy to work with Jalan uh, in her uh, PhD program uh, at University of Michigan. And so pleased and honored that you're able to join us uh, today. Jalan has uh, recently founded Empowering a Green Environment and Economy LLC, a strategic consulting firm with the mission of transforming communities through the development of people-centered solutions. She serves a diverse set of clients with forward thinking and intersectional approaches to tackle issues such as climate change, public health, environmental injustice, and advancing racial equity. Jalan has multi-sectoral experience having worked in environmental philanthropy, state government, nonprofit, grassroots, ac academia, and private industry. Most notably, she created and implemented the Transformational Climate Resilient and Equitable Water Systems Initiative at the Kresge Foundation as a senior program officer. She was the first director of We Act for Environmental Justice's Federal Policy Office in Washington, D.C., and her doctoral research illuminated the impact of climate change and extreme heat on the low-income elderly in Detroit, and is still referenced to drive public health interventions. A native of Detroit, Jalan earned a PhD in environmental health sciences from the University of Michigan, a master's degree in environmental engineering from Southern Methodist University, a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Northwestern University, and her certificate in diversity and inclusion from Cornell University. Jalan serves on multiple national and local academic nonprofit and for-profit boards. She is a lecturer at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health, a lifetime member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Inc. and a proud mom of Ariel and oh, Jan Jan Janellen. <laughs> Little JJ. Little JJ. <laughs> Sorry about that. Jalan, so thanks so much for joining us today. No worries. Thank you so much, Dan, for the kind introduction. I hate that you had to read all that. <laughs> you could have totally shortened it. Um, and, and Molly, thank you so much for kind of all of your support on the back end as well. So um, again, so happy to be here. And I will say that um, I am coming off of, uh, just got off of facilitating an environmental justice town hall uh, as the state of Michigan our Department of Environment and Great Lakes and Energy is hosting their first environmental justice conference uh, this year. And it's of course today, yesterday and, to, and tomorrow. So um, there's just been a lot of great energy, a lot of discussions, and really I think relative to, to what we're gonna chat about today. So um, thank you all for, for being here. And you know, uh, I wanna also, before just jumping into my comments, just you know, recognize that uh, I'm not here on kind of my own efforts, but just the, the importance of my ancestors and their contributions to this world that got me to where I am now. And also really acknowledging the fact that I am again calling from Southeastern Michigan and I am uh, in my home on the original and stolen lands of the Potawatomi. So um, I think that's super important. And uh, again, as we talk about these issues of environment and justice and climate, um, we got to realize that there were folks taking care of this land probably much better than we are <laughs> that came before us. So, you know, the question that I, I really want to uh, maybe, you know, spur some conversation tonight around is, is this concept of vulnerability. And I think uh, when I was, uh, you know, when I first met Dan at University of Michigan School of Public Health, um, you know, kind of the public health lingo was around people being vulnerable. 
and you know, kind of like who are the vulnerable populations, um, particularly as you talk about public health interventions. And you know, I just realized, you know, that you know, people don't really like to be, uh, I guess, characterized as vulnerable. Uh, it's kind of this, this negative connotation. And so, as I've worked again across these different sectors, and particularly in this space, um, and particularly where we are now as we have you know, some made some advances in climate and environmental justice. Um, the question that I, that I really want us to touch on tonight is you know, who is more vulnerable? Is it the people or is it the system? And so I think it's always important to give a little context and, and kind of so you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, I'm a native Detroiter, uh, have mad love for Detroit, and really at an early age, I had this interest in science and nature. And I love science fair projects and all that good stuff and took samples out the Rouge River in Detroit. And in high school, I had an opportunity to work at Dow Chemical Corporation in Midland, Michigan, which is probably a couple hours north of Detroit. And part of it was uh, this kind of mentorship program for high school students who wanted to pursue engineering. And I wanted to be a chemical engineer. And so I spent several summers in Midland. And so, you know, while I was learning about mass balances and chemical reactions and all those things, um, something that also came up in my internship with this con was this concept of corporate responsibility. And Dow being one of the major producers of chemicals and again, shipping chemicals across the country in many different modes. Um, I learned that when they would have these huge trucks taking chemicals from community to community, that unfortunately, most of the truck accidents and where more spills happened were in low-income communities and communities of color or those communities on the other side of the railroad tracks. And so that was really disturbing and intriguing to me. And so when I came back home to Detroit, you know, I began to look around my environment. And, you know, the second picture is my home church that I grew up in, which happens to be the church of Aretha Franklin, the late great Aretha Franklin, on the west side of Detroit. And unfortunately, the environment around my church was one that was not uh, a healthy environment for many folks. In addition to the, the lack of air quality, many of the homes um, were, uh, again, uh, had lead in them. And so there was a, a great propensity of children and adults that had high levels of lead that, of course, led to developmental delays and other challenges. And, and then as I, again, was in high school, at that time, I was kind of doing grocery shopping for my grandparents and my great aunts that lived very close to the church. And that bottom picture that you'll see is, you know, really the only grocery market grocery store that was in the neighborhood. <laughs> and so I really learned this understanding of, of kind of the concept of food deserts and the fact that I couldn't find fresh meat or fresh vegetables for my grandparents and my great aunts. And I had to drive a little bit farther to kind of get that nourishment that they needed. And so after leaving high school, I went on to Northwestern University and, and spent some time in Chicago. Again, I was studying engineering, but again, I was still trying to understand like this whole concept of, you know, how certain communities could be more at risk than others. And so I decided to do a dual major in engineering and journalism because I always love to write and had an opportunity to spend some time on the South side of Chicago and wrote one of the first articles in the Northwestern Daily, which was our daily paper, about environmental justice and the experiences of those South Side communities that were dealing with lead smelters and poor water quality and you name it. And so environmental justice, again, came home to me through those experiences both in Michigan and uh, in Chicago. But what really, again, hit home for me is the, this notion of you know, systems not being, I would say, ready to protect those communities and those folks that were higher at risk for certain environmental insults and climate insults. And particularly as I was being, uh, really serving as, as the primary caregiver for my grandparents that again, lived in Detroit 60 plus years of their lives. Um, you know, I saw that our health department and some of our social service agencies just were not meeting the par. And so, 
what my research really stemmed from, my doctoral research stemmed from was the fact that I, I witnessed my grandparents um, struggling and suffering as our communities got hotter and literally their home was hazardous to their health and the fact that not only they were, were they experiencing kind of the onset of dementia and Alzheimer's, but their bodies weren't able to thermoregulate. And their doctors, you know, were prescribing medicines that made it even harder for them to thermoregulate. And then their home was like, again, this hot box that, uh, you know, they, they really couldn't get any relief. And then they really weren't in, this, in the right mindset to understand that I think my body's overheating and experiencing heat stress in ways that they didn't really imagine. And so that really led to these questions of, you know, what does vulnerability really look like? Um, could it be that your, your home um, makes you more vulnerable? And then what are the systemic pieces that are missing that again, exacerbate this vulnerability? And I soon realized that this was not just a Detroit phenomenon. Again, going into my postdoc at the Union of Concerned Scientists in DC, had an opportunity to kind of ask the same question across the country and really look at what were the heat plans in place or not in place in different counties that were, again, really working to address this, this issue of extreme heat and particularly how it impacts certain populations, the elderly, houseless populations. And that there was a need to strengthen this, this system and these first responders uh, because they were missing populations, it wasn't communication, it wasn't well funded and still in many places isn't. And you know, really understanding the importance of heat adaptation as being, again, that silent killer that really didn't get a lot of attention until the Chicago heat wave in 95. And so went on to, again, <laughs> understand that the risks aren't just around extreme heat. Um, Unfortunately, I feel like most of my experiences with climate change are real personal. And this is a picture of my parents' basement, uh, really the last couple of years uh, that has flooded with four, four to five feet of water <laughs> over the past couple of years, most recently in December of 2020. And you might ask why? Well, you know, climate change is again, increasing the frequency and severity of rain and, and flooding and storm events. But why would my parents' home, of all homes, flood repeatedly? But this, again, was not just something that my parents were experiencing. It is still happening across the city of Detroit in many cities across this country. And again, the kicker is that when you talk about vulnerability, you know, who is responsible for this increased vulnerability in certain communities? Well, I think a part of it is the fact that there is not the proper infrastructure or maintenance of infrastructure to manage heavy loads of, of rain and flooding, particularly in certain areas in certain communities across the Detroit metropolitan region. And this could be the same conversation I'm having with folks in Atlanta and other places. That the health department was not a part of the conversation because again, a flood happens but there's things after the fact that you need to be cognizant of. You know, was that home remediated properly? Uh, you know, is there mold there that can again exacerbate other health conditions? All these different pieces, and then the fact that there was immunity for utilities. So basically, the utilities were like, "Oh, wasn't my fault. It's the residents' fault. They didn't, you know, snake out their pipes in the basement." all these sort of things. And again, when you talk about the systemic and institutional issues across these different agencies that are supposed to serve communities, again, you see the barriers, you see just the inadequacies that again, put certain communities at risk, but also don't really allow them to recover. And I think one of the most striking examples is that um, Detroit is situated near a community uh, or a city called Gross Point, which is very affluent, um, again, right across the way. And Gross Point, again, experienced a similar flooding and, and extreme storms, but they had the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, the green infrastructure in place to prevent the flooding of many of the homes in that community. But again, right across the way, there were several communities and neighborhoods in Detroit that experienced that flooding a little bit differently and are still trying to recover today. 
And so again, as you talk about these repeated insults, again, due to what I think are failures in the system, it's not only a monetary cost, but it's also a physical cost and a mental health cost. Because again, when you think about these repeated insults, whether it's repeatedly experiencing heat stress or repeatedly being flooded out of your home, that is a sort of trauma that again, we should have agencies and systems and institutions in place to relieve. And so public health, again, it, it, it impacts again, not only the physical, but the, the health of the community and the mental piece, which I think is sometimes has been discounted and not enough attention has been paid. But I tell you in this, this, this new COVID reality, um, you know, we're gonna have to deal with some serious mental health issues, not only for folks that are experiencing climate extremes, but again, our children and other populations that have been, again, just their worlds have been shifted and changed because of this pandemic, plus all the other issues that they experience. And so as I think about that infrastructure and not just the water infrastructure that's failed, it's that infrastructure of social services organizations, of health departments, of other governmental agencies that have failed our people. And that failure, I truly believe is linked to racism. Again, both the institutional, so again, you know, the, the policies and practices and the structural pieces. And so that racism uh, has been around for, for so long, regardless of the fact that folks are kind of waking up over the past couple of years, <laughs> racism has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And that reality, when you look at the health and the climate injustice, it, it makes sense that we're seeing communities with more polluted air, water, and land than others. It makes sense that we see communities that are being displaced due to extreme weather. It makes sense that we continue to see people that are dying prematurely because you know, there's no environmental enforcement in their community and other hazards are allowed to just occur and happen. And so as we think about COVID and again, all these layers of, of, of risk that increase vulnerability to certain populations, we have to begin to address those root causes of these issues that we are seeing, and that is racism. So I spent some time in DC, and part of my time was as, as the director of federal policy for an environmental justice organization that was based in Harlem, New York, but I ran our DC policy office. And what I think was, was really beautiful about that was that it was an opportunity for communities across the country to really raise their voices on these issues of systemic and institutional racism, particularly in front of some of the agencies in DC, like the Environmental Protection Agency and, and Department of Interior, et cetera, that had a, a, a huge role and could have a huge impact on the communities across this country. And Part of the time that I was in DCC, we spent on, uh, again, former President Obama's climate action plan and trying to make sure that this plan uh, was not only going to focus on mitigation, but again, mitigation that was actually going to get to making communities that are most at risk a little bit better, a little bit healthier, but also ensuring that our voices were a part of shaping those solutions. And you'll see pictured here, the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum on Climate Change, which was a national coalition uh, that, that I've served as a director for, again, voices from across the country shaping federal policy. And then not forgetting that an important, uh, I, I guess, segment of those voices are our youth. And so my daughters pictured here were very much probably engaged more than they wanted to be in public hearings and talking with the administrator of the EPA. But, but what's important is that how we begin to address these injustices and in systemic racism and institutional racism is making sure that again, all voices are heard. And so, you know, it's exciting when we think about transitions, at least I get excited because it's about change. Um, whether we're talking about a change in the state of matter, my daughter's studying, you know, honors chemistry now. So that was top of mind for me. Or in this season right now where we're experiencing graduations and even with the transition of power at the federal level and then thinking about what life is gonna be like after COVID. These are all transitions, which transitions can be a good thing. But 
what I wanna push you to think about is do we just want transition or transformation? And I don't know about you, but I've probably gained my COVID 50 pounds. And so I need a transformation in my physical space. I also think about the beautiful transition or transformation of a butterfly. But also as we think about the larger social movements that have really come about um, you know, over these past couple of years in terms of Black Lives Matter and addressing Asian hate, you know, again, what does transformation really mean in this space to achieve environmental justice and social justice and climate justice? It can't just be a transition. It really has to be something that kind of shifts the physical, the social, and the cultural space within an institution. And so for me, as I think about a just transformation, um, it can't look like what it was. It must feel a little bit different. You want it to be impactful and reach those folks that have been invisible or forgotten. Again, as you talk about transformation, it must be shaped by its environment, not just somebody that created something in an ivory tower, but really taking in input from the folks that are in that space. It has to also get into the institutional piece, address unseen barriers processes and the ways decisions are made. It might be uncomfortable and sometimes painful, right? And it requires like a deeper level of introspection and not just kind of like surface level quick fixes. But I think the most important thing is that if that transformation happens right and in a manner that is fair and just, that the on the other side, you know, people will be empowered and, and people and institutions will be more purposeful, which I think is where we need to, to think about as we talk about environmental justice and climate justice. And so I've been fortunate to work across many different institutions and, and we are all in need of some type of transformation, whether it's in private industry and, and noting that, you know, again, I spent 15 years in private industry as an engineer and this, this whole thing about profit over people and the bottom line is real but that's gonna require transformation. Whether it's how we think about, you know, who has the power in academia and what type of research is more important than others. Philanthropy, again, how and who we give our money to. Uh, again, many disparities in philanthropy, but again, philanthropy is in the process of transforming itself. And then, you know, we talk about funding and, and community-based organizations and how they have been, particularly Black, Indigenous, or people of color-led organizations have gotten the short shrift for a long time. But again, philanthropy is trying to, to change that and transform that. And then, of course, this whole notion of, of what science is valuable and the importance of traditional and Indigenous knowledge, you know, being just as important as you know, data taken from a monitor. So again, how do we begin to think about this transformation within our institutions? And so I talk a lot about infrastructure because I've been working on water for the past five years at the foundation. And so we were really keen on like, you know, we, we don't just want gray infrastructure, the pipes, we wanna, you know, get green infrastructure. So we'll have bioswells and things of that nature that provide multiple benefits. The physical infrastructure is super important, right? But also we need to think about some of the infrastructures that we don't emphasize and support as much. And so those are social networks within community. Those social networks sometimes keep people alive in an extreme event of any kind. Uh, our health infrastructure, we've seen how a dilapidated health structure um, cannot serve the communities that need it, particularly in this COVID crisis and others. Policy infrastructures, a structure around accountability, which I think is missing in so many different ways, and the financial infrastructure that, again, is going to benefit all and not just a couple of people. And so when we talk about transformation, it has to be inclusive. And so I really get bothered when the blame of brokenness is put on an individual versus the system. Because oftentimes, as I've seen in different places, you know, it's like, well, that community could have done better. They should eat better. Um, they should be able to take transportation and do whatever. But it's like, obviously, you know, there are some barriers that are preventing this person from eating healthy or taking the best transportation or being able to put their kid in a certain school. 
And so how do we begin to make solutions that are not only transformative, but again, include the needs and the voices of those that again, have been left out of the equation. And then also with that inclusion, how do we make sure that we are again, holding these institutions and systems accountable? It was interesting, um, you know, as I reflected back, particularly with this new administration, back in 2016, I wrote this article around a policy approach to climate justice. And what's exciting is that some of the things that I, you know, uh, I, I guess some of the suggestions that I made are really, you know, coming to fruition in, you know, the agency's work and the agencies, meaning the EPA and others in DC. And so I think as we move forward and think about climate justice and environmental justice and health, how do we get to make, how do we continue to make sure that we are holding ourselves accountable, that we are tracking what we're doing, that we're acknowledging the things that don't work so we can try something different, but then also making sure that we're again, engaging the folks that are most impacted, which again is not rocket science, but hasn't happened, uh, I would say the way it needs to be. So I wanna talk now about a couple of, uh, I guess, concrete examples in terms of transformation. And I'm gonna start with philanthropy. And so, as I mentioned, I had an opportunity to build out an initiative um, to really focus on strengthening and transforming water systems in a way that they are more responsible to the needs of low-income communities and communities of color. And oftentimes when we talk about water, I mean, I would say even pre the Flint water crisis, um, you know, water and equity and then climate that, you know, those words didn't come together that much. And I think one of the things that, uh, you know, I realized very, very, very quickly is that there's an education component that needs to happen. Because if you're a water utility, you know, your mandate is to deliver water. Now, whether you do that equitably, affordably, affordably or not, I probably just made up a word, um, that sometimes isn't top of mind for many water utility leaders. And so there needed to be some education around what equity means in the water space and how you actually operationalize that. But also from a community-based organization and their perspective around water equity, again, really understanding what's within their power to kind of control and shift um, and, and how can they learn some of the barriers that these utilities face. So then, you know, it's not just this notion of, you know, screaming at the utility folks, but how can we begin to work better together? And so this initiative brought together all the different players across water from academia, utility, community, et cetera, to really, first of all, understand each other's language, but then also think about what are the ways that we could begin to work better together to address this huge issue that we all are facing. And so that first step was supporting an organization called the US Water Alliance to really figure out what does an equitable water future mean? Really defining water equity across several pillars. And again, giving folks you know, some tangible ways and practices to begin to implement water equity in their own way. I think also what I learned from the philanthropic side is that you know, again, there are great organizations and groups working across this country on many different things. And so whether you're a planning organization like the Trust for Public Land and, and creating tools to help, um, GIS-based tools to help with planning, or whether you're a resilience fund that pulls money together through public-private partnerships to address huge issues like water, or if you're a group of doctors that are really trying to like go beyond just practice, but get into advocacy. You know, again, all of these different pieces and all these different players, you know, are aligned with putting people in the center of whatever they're doing and, and whatever their solution. And so I think philanthropy and its role is to help really instigate that and create those spaces and places where people who might not have worked together before can actually come together and work better together. I also want to think about or, or really share the wonderful work of an organization called Groundwork USA that essentially has, I, I don't want to say chapters, but they basically have, uh, I would say, distinct bodies in different cities across the country 
that work on different issues. And it's a real focus on youth development, uh, environmental, um, and, and really kind of social capacity. And so we supported Groundwork USAs like in six or different, six or seven different cities. But what they really did, which was I think was awesome, and you're seeing a lot of that now, is taking the, the historical redlining maps, which basically again showed the areas that were disinvested in, that uh, only people of color immigrants were forced to live in that usually didn't have um, you know, the resources, the infrastructure. Uh, bad housing, um, basically we're not going to get funded, you know, we're unable to get a mortgage, basically using these basically racist redlining maps and then overlaying these maps with areas that experience high flooding or areas that experience, you know, extreme heat and creating these maps for these different communities to one, educate the community on these multiple, again, layers of risk, but also the communities were able to use these tools in planning and having conversation with their electeds. And again, again, working towards change. And so again, how philanthropy can support the development of these tools and, and these pilots that can be used across the bounds, not only around environmental issues, but on others was super intriguing. And then I think one of the, the, the coolest parts was really supporting the formation of a Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus. Oftentimes in the environmental movement historically, there have been one set of voices that kind of guide policy and, and, and solutions. And really, you know, um, I would say the mainstream environmental organizations have mostly been uh, the majority white and white men. And so as you think about equity and, and what that means and how if you're having certain communities that are feeling the disproportionate impact and they're not a part of these policy conversations or they're not a part of these large mainstream organizations that are setting the policy trajectory, that's a problem. And so what I had asked PolicyLink and the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy to do was really figure out, was there a need or desire by again, EJ and social justice organizations to create their own platform in place, well, really create their own space to develop a platform from them that, again, elevated some of their unique and distinct needs um, around water equity and climate resilience. And so after a couple of years, this has grown into uh, a caucus of 90 plus organizations. They have helped shape many of the current administration's policy around water. It has been amazing. But again, it is something that has been led and created by community with a little bit of impetus from philanthropy. So now I'm gonna switch into what I'm doing now. Uh, I started my own consulting practice uh, early February of this year and um, you know, really tried to think about all the different learnings that I've, again, taken in across many different sectors with the goal of transforming communities and doing that through people-centered solutions. So basically I'm trying to really challenge institutions to think better, to do better, and give them the tools to kind of move from point A to point B. And so I wanna share just a couple of examples of the, some of the things that I'm working on that I think is relevant to this conversation. So, you know, again, right now we're seeing a lot of corporations, a lot of organizations thinking differently about how they operate. Um, I'm working with uh, a regional, uh, government in Vancouver, Canada, um, because they are interested in figuring out how equity, uh, you know, kind of can be operationalized through their core service streams. And so they do air quality planning, affordable housing, liquid waste, um, man water management, all these different core critical services in communities. And so I've been working with them to really think about what does this mean uh, to operationalize equity um, within these plans and how do you change the way you operate to again better meet the needs of your residents, the, the residents of these 21 municipalities and the First Nations that are very much connected in Vancouver. As I mentioned uh, earlier, I've been working with the state of Michigan, particularly their new office of the Environmental Justice Public Advocate. And part of, again, achieving justice and understanding system vulnerabilities is really listening to people. And so part of what we've done over the past month and a half was conduct 
eight regional roundtables with diverse groups of stakeholders in different parts of Michigan to again, understand what's working, what's not working and how the state can be more supportive in advancing environmental justice. And so there's been some really telling things that have come out of these conversations. But again, this whole notion of conversation and, and well, really communication is important, particularly when you're talking about government entities where there can sometimes be a lack of transparency, uh, there can sometimes be a lack of trust. And, and so it takes a little bit more effort to rebuild that back where communities actually feel like they have a partner to work with. I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that I'm doing in industry. And I know you all are probably super duper aware, but this whole transition to electric vehicles and what that means. And oftentimes, you know, I would say folks say, oh my God, this is a great thing, right? Less emissions, um, cool electric vehicles. I mean, who doesn't want a Tesla? I just can't afford one. I do. But there are some implications to this transition uh, to electric vehicles. And I'm working with MIT and a couple of other researchers to really look at the environmental justice implications of this transition, particularly for automotive manufacturers that are in the Midwest, in the heartland, and really looking at, okay, so it's not only a workforce transition, but it's also, you know, what happens to the physical environment? What about the health of the community? Um, how are communities being engaged in this transition and will this transition to EVs, electric vehicles, uh, impact the affordability or the access or actually increase pollution in some areas? And so this is some research that I'm engaged in now and we're, we're gonna be putting out a set of policy recommendations uh, at the end of summer. Um, the next piece I wanna to speak to is on the practice side. And I think there are so many organizations that again are working you know, to improve policy that are working to help professionals and practitioners like, you know, sharpen their skills around equity and justice. And so a lot of my work also is, is really kind of looking at what are those institutional barriers? What are those things within your institution that you might not have named, but are really keeping you from like moving forward? And so within our DC, again, the Natural Resources Defense Council that does a lot of policy work, uh, working with them to identify ways where they can make their policies more stronger and even how they even come to those solutions, again, and the people that they involve or don't involve. Um, with the Aspen Global Change Institute, uh, you know, really thinking about board diversity and, and what that means for a, a climate organization that, again, brings in so many different voices and perspectives and, and how diversity can improve their impact. And then at the practitioner level, where you have folks that are working on green stormwater infrastructure across the country to deal with flooding, you know, what does equity mean in that space and how do you operationalize that? Again, uh, go beyond your mandate to make sure that equity and justice is a part of that conversation. So I would say from where you all are sitting, and I don't know the full audience, but I would assume that uh, most of you are, are, are students or graduate students or in academia, or whatever, you know, I think about what are the ways that you can begin to support transformation where you sit now in your role. And I would say, you know, uh, really thinking about ways to shape your research agenda around the people you want to be in service to. And one of the cool things that I thought, you know, as I was going through my dissertation process was that I, you know, I didn't just kind of dream that up, but it actually came out of the need from the Detroit Health Department. And, you know, building on to, you know, not just something that I want to do for fun, but something that could hopefully be in service, not only to the citizens of Detroit and my grandparents, but to the city. And so filling a gap, um, really thinking about solutions focus. Uh, oftentimes, you know, environmental justice communities or communities that have been disadvantaged and disproportionately impacted have been overstudied, like you know, they know what the problems are. <laughs> so how can we focus research that is on the solutions? Within your institution, you know, think about how you go beyond the quick fixes and the one-offs or the shiny equity statements that really don't get implemented or operationalized. You know, how can you begin to challenge yourself and your institution to dig a little bit deeper? I think is super important. 
I also think that tracking <laughs> your progress and holding uh, yourselves accountable is important because what you don't measure, you miss. And again, we have to think about that on every level, you know, not just the metrics of, you know, maybe how many, you know, papers that we publish, but, you know, what is the impact of the work that I am doing? And maybe even co-creating those measures or metrics with the community that you're, you're working in or working for. Um, I mean, there's many other things, but, but I would say, again, in each space, you know, asking a sort of, you know, a set of key questions, you know, uh, you know, helps build the case for equity, you know, um, who is going to be impacted by this decision, whatever you're doing, you know, are there folks that will benefit, you know, are there some unintentional consequences that I'm missing that I might want to make sure is in kind of my, you know, the way I'm setting up my research plan or, or my analysis. So all those things come into play. Again, very, I think, kind of just practical questions that we need to keep top of mind. And so again, as you think about, you know, the work that you're doing and really, you know, where I started this, this conversation at the top of the presentation, who is really vulnerable? And I, I hope that you maybe uh, have a sense of how you would answer that for yourself. Um, which might be a little different than me, which is totally fine. But again, uh, my, my thinking is, uh, you know, it's not just about how you answer the question, but what are you going to do about it uh, in your work and your positions of power and privilege and whatever to make sure that what you're doing is, is going to be not hazardous <laughs> to the health of the communities that you're trying to serve. So with that, I thank you so much for your time and attention. And I think I will probably turn it back over to Dan. Thank you so much. Uh, we were all in the same room. I'm sure we'd be applauding uh, your excellent presentation. I really appreciate that um, sort of full scope of work and your own personal evolution in that um, going from the earlier sort of conception of vulnerability and uh, towards a much more transformational view of environmental justice. Uh, and in fact, you, um, you started to hit there on the last slide on the question was going through my mind. I, I my question was gonna be, and I'll, I'll ask it, but um, I think you kind of answer it in a way by twisting it around. My question was going to be, what are the big questions in EJ that we should be looking at? You're kind of saying it's how you ask the questions that are sort of, and who you ask them with that mm -hmm. is critically important and how, and how we engage in those questions. Um, but I still want to ask the question of where you see um, sort of the science questions from all of the different kinds of engagements, you have this amazing perspective across sectors that uh, so few people have. Where do you see the, a lot of the folks in our school and our college are natural scientists. Where's that interface? And you worked at that interface in your own work between the sort of atmospheric uh, the weather to the impact. We wanna go from understanding not just distributions, but how we, what we can do about it. Any thoughts on the nature of those questions that we should be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I think what's, what's super important is realizing that this, this work, in my humble opinion, around equity and justice is, is not just about the outcome, but it's about the process and how you do it. So regardless of you know, where you're coming from, whether you're a natural scientist or you're like stemmed in discovery, you know, science or, you know, you're a public health practitioner, like, you know, the questions that my mentor shared with me when I was working in WEAC was like, okay, so, you know, what are you doing? Who's going to benefit or who is not going to benefit? And how are you going to make sure that um, whatever you're leaving with behind is going to be better for that community. So whether that's a policy, whether that's a study, like, you know, those are kind of the basic questions. And now you tailor those questions, you know, to, you know, kind of maybe whatever vein of work you're, 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 you're digging into. But, you know, I think about, 
you know, my work with Metro Vancouver. And, you know, I am definitely not an expert on affordable housing, but I've been working with their affordable housing team because they're like, okay, well, you know, you know, we want to, we want to build equity into how we're doing our work. And I'm like, okay, well, um, who's being impacted by your decisions? You know, are you aware of any disparities? And I think sometimes as scientists, whether it's national scientists or whatever, social scientists, you know, oftentimes the biggest hurdle is the data. <laughs> you either don't have it or you're not collecting the right data or you're collecting too much of it and it's not really telling you anything. And so that to me is the first question, really understanding like, you know, not only again, who you should be serving and who should be benefiting, but do you have a clear picture of, you know, like, is your, it, for example, is your data disaggregated by race or income or, you know, are you able to create that narrative to really understand, you know, who might not be benefiting from a particular decision, policy, research, et cetera. And so, you know, one of the other um, hats that I wear, which has been super beneficial, is serving on the board of directors for the American Geophysical Union, where, I mean, it's like a gazillion amount of scientists, right? <laughs> and so a lot of, you know, the conversations that we've been having is how do you weave in this whole question of equity into someone who's studying space science or someone, you know, where it seems like it's just like this, you know, question that is way beyond what, you know, this particular scientific realm should care about. And I think again, you know, you know, from the atmospheric side, again, who are you in service to? So if you're grabbing data from a satellite or you're, you know, whatever, how can you begin to make this product usable? You know, this, this whole thing of, you know, usable science. And, and what that really means, I think, is how you take it to the next level. Like some science is gonna be strictly for discovery, which is awesome. I mean, that's the exciting. But again, how do you begin to make science usable and useful to populations that maybe have not had access, um, really need the data, or really need, you know, whatever to help build their case to, to make their community stronger. So, you know, I feel like, that is the critical question. Like, who are you trying to serve? Who's benefiting? But you've got to have the right data to even begin that conversation. Mm -hmm. Great. We have a question in the chat here. Um, is flood insurance really working for the coastal populations? How about the poorest and people of color? Do they get to participate in a community rating system? Why do people of color reside in coastal areas, high flooding or extremely heated areas? Yeah, and I think Qiying, hopefully I'm saying that correctly. And if I'm not, forgive me. Um, oh my gosh. So flood insurance, this is something that there's this wonderful organization called Fair Share Housing Center based in New Jersey um, that I funded while I was at the foundation. And um, they did a great study, which I'll try and find on terms of, you know, how insurance, flood insurance in particular is or is not working. And what I will say, again, not being an insurance expert, but even from my parents' experience <laughs> over the past couple of years and being their pseudo lawyer, flooding insurance, first of all, you know, there are communities that don't have insurance, particularly when you talk about low-income communities and communities of color. They, they either don't have it um, or can't afford it, or they weren't offered it. And so, you know, insurance kind of sort of only works for the folks that have it. But then in my parents' case, even the folks that have insurance, the, the insurance industry, again, this is my opinion, um, you know, tries to find a way to get out of actually paying and compensating folks, particularly, and there is, you know, studies to prove this, low-income communities and communities of color, particularly when there's been repeated issues around high, high flooding, as you say, um, and particularly in the coastal areas. So, um, you know, when, it, when, I, when I talk about like these systemic institutional issues, like, you know, there needs to be a reform in the insurance industry and there needs to be a reform in how I would say, oh my gosh, how certain areas and communities are compensated when there is, 
you know, a huge disruption because, for example, if the state, whatever state you're in, doesn't declare a, a federal emergency, then some of those communities don't get funds to actually rebuild. And so when you talk about some of the interstitial flooding, the flooding that happens in neighborhoods, that's not like, you know, because of a hurricane, those folks don't get any funds. They don't get compensated. And so again, unfortunately, in most cases, there are some cases in Southern Florida where you actually have low income communities and communities of color that are on higher land than others. But in other situations around the country, oftentimes when, when I spoke about the redlining, part of the, the lack of infrastructure and the fact that immigrants and people of color in low-income communities got thrown into these areas that not only didn't have the proper water infrastructure, but you know were disinvested in in typically low-lying areas. That is why we see and continue to see you know the same people getting hurt again by flooding and heat every time. They don't have the water infrastructure. They don't have trees. They don't have green space. It is a reason for that. And it's historical and goes back to the fact that that's the way those communities were planned. They, they were not planned to take care of immigrants and people of color and indigenous people. And so, you know, again, when the system is set up not to protect you <laughs> in the beginning, um, it's hard to get out of that. And so there has to be some huge transformations that occur at FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, there needs to be some huge transformations in our insurance industry. And when you talk about real estate and where people develop, I believe that there needs to be some transformations there because there should be disclosures that say, okay, you're moving into you know, a high flood zone. And, and what does that mean? Not allowing people to build in these places. And that is still happening now. Like they are allowing folks to build in places that might not be there in a couple of years. So uh, Chi Yang, your, your question is um, one that I hope this current administration at the federal level will really begin to address because, you know, we're going to continue to see more flooding. We're going to continue to get hotter and, um, you know, I, I, when I worked in industry, we would use duct tape, that, that big gray tape, you know, to, to slap around a pipe or a pump, you know, as a quick fix, but that duct tape ultimately wears away and you're still left with the problem. So how do we begin to, you know, address these <laughs> systemic issues, you know, is not a band-aid, but, but how do we begin to Really, and that's where that equity analysis comes in. Who are the folks that are not, that, that are being failed by the system and how do we fix it? Because if we take care of those that are the most vulnerable in the system, then we'll end up taking care of everybody else. I probably went too far, but. <laughs> so you're really describe, describing from a sort of knowledge perspective, what we need to know, it's, it's the natural world, it's the social world, it's the institutional structures, it's historical perspectives, it's economics. We need to bring all of that together. And, and this kind of transformative science that you're talking about is a, a collaborative transdisciplinary science that's gonna get at solutions. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we can no longer, I mean, I, you know, again, um, <laughs> we can't have these, these silo tables and, you know, you know, when you think about one of the, the biggest barriers that I've seen, whether it's in philanthropy or government, is that, you know, you have these people that are working in silos. We cannot, people don't experience life in silos. <laughs> Again, you know, so, so how do you begin to kind of get rid of those silos so we can actually come up with solutions that make sense and, you know, may actually solve for more than one problem? And so, you know, one of my mentors, you know, a long time ago told me like, you know, if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu, right? So if we don't have public health folks at the table, if we don't have communities at the table, if we don't have, you know, the financial folks at the table, you know, then is our solution really, I don't know, robust? Is it going to be sustainable? Mm -hmm. um, so that is... I mean, it's, it's enough of this silo stuff. Like we have to think intersectionally because that is how we experience life. 
-hmm. It's not just COVID, it's COVID plus the fact that, you know, I didn't have access to healthcare anyway because I didn't have insurance and oh, by the way, I lost my job. So it's, it's all these different factors that come into play. Yeah. So Athena has a question and Athena, I can just let you uh, talk if you like. Um, you've got some personal background there to share as well. Sure. Um, thank you, Dr. White Newsom, for being here. And I think we've met previously. I'm actually a former Crosby Climate Change Health and Equity Initiative consultant um, and also a child of Michigan. So <laughs> um, I appreciate oh. sharing, sharing this space with you tonight. Um, and my question is Do you have any insight on how we can or should um, begin to measure progress? Uh, or not, or identify where that may not be happening toward program goals that encompass dismantling systemic inequity and racism, um, something, you know, that is hard and long-term and sort of difficult to measure in a quantitative way. I'm just wondering from your experience if you have thoughts on where we might begin, again, to sort of identify progress toward that and, again, also help um, from a data collection viewpoint, identify where there's still gaps and hard work that needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, Athena, so first of all, thanks for um, <laughs> your question and, and thank you for being here. And, you know, what I will say, you know, I was listening to the administrator of the EPA, Michael Regan, speak yesterday. And he was, was talking about like the, the first directive he gave to his staff was, you know, basically I want EJ in everything, environmental justice in everything and how you do it, what the outcomes look like. And it can no longer be an add on or afterthought. And so part of what I'm trying to do in my consulting practice is just that, um, you know, the first step, again, is, is the question I ask my clients, you know, what does success look like? Like if you were able to create this vision of, of equity in whatever space, what does that look like? Because you have to have a clear understanding of where you're going. And then the question becomes after that, what do we need to measure? What metrics, what indicators, whatever terminology you want to use, do we need to have to make sure that we are actually making impact, but also holding ourselves accountable. And so one of the things that, that I think get real sticky is that, you know, folks want to just come up with their metrics and indicators on their own, you know, folks within an institution. But to me, you know, in order for it to be <laughs> transformative, you need to do that in concert with the folks that you are, you know, serving or providing whatever to. So what I've been, you know, working on specifically is how do you create these, these spaces where a government entity and a community can co-create a set of metrics or indicators. So it's not just self-service of the organization or the government, whatever, but it's also them hearing, you know, what are the important things from that community? Because a part of what you do as government is you, you are a, a public servant. So if you have no idea of, of what's important to the community or what's being prioritized or should be prioritized by that community, then I feel like your metrics and indicators will not get you anywhere towards equity. And so I would say those are the first two things that I would say, you know, again, you know, understanding what your vision looks like in terms of equity, but then co-creating those metrics or indicators with the communities that you're, you're tasked to serve. And, and I would say those metrics need to be both quantitative and qualitative. So one of the things that uh, I was working on at Kresge, because again, I am like, you know, nothing frustrates me more if you're just doing a bunch of work and giving a bunch of money and you don't know if it's even having any impact. And so one of the things that um, <laughs> I tried to, 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 to really build you know, before I left is this group of about 15 of my organizations that, again, I was grant making to, again, we wanted to create some equity metrics around climate resilience and equitable water systems. And so I will tell you that process was not easy. If you're 
thinking about bringing together 15 people <laughs> with different viewpoints, different perspectives, different perspectives, different experiences, um, working at different levels and trying to coalesce around a set of metrics, that's hard. But the cool part about it is that we were able to create a set of metrics that were community informed, that people could see themselves in, that they would then wanna actually collect. And then when you, when you create this kind of system, you not only create buy-in, but you increase learning and education and all this stuff, but then you can see what your collective impact is because you, everybody can see a piece of themselves in, in these indicators. And so I think as you talk about, again, you know, dismantling the systemic stuff is not something that's going to happen overnight. It's not, right? But at least when you talk about <laughs> understanding that you're in for the long game, seeing those small but appreciated, appreciable steps in the right direction is important. And so I think that's another another benefit of creating metrics and indicators. So you know that you're at least headed in the right direction and you check yourself on a certain frequency. You're building buy-in and trust with the communities that you're working with. And then hopefully at the end of it, you will see some change, you know, that, that kind of leads to this broader vision. Um, so again, I, probably more detail than you want, Athena, but that's kind of the approach that I've been taking with, with several of my clients. And that looks different for every client. <laughs> so we, we are uh, sort of at the end of our time, but we have one more question that um, from our community, uh, we have a lot of folks working in the conservation world. Um, and so there's a question here about from actually from our speaker from last uh, week, who is um, with the Quinault tribe in uh, Olympic Peninsula asking the question about um, advice on how to address conservation-based environmental justice, initiatives like reserves, national parks, national forests have a long history of affecting disadvantaged communities. The 30 by 30 initiative that is being promoted holds uh, great risk for these communities. So 30% um, of land conserved by 2030, I think is the 30 by 30. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and I, I Boy, so I am definitely not an expert in conservation-based environmental justice, but um, so I am probably not going to give a satisfactory response. And I'm, I'm very blatant about what I don't know and <laughs> staying in my lane. Yeah. But what I will say is that um, in working with Metro Vancouver, which again, the Canadians, um, they don't really talk about racial equity, but it's more about social equity. And because of the history, um, the very tragic history of, um, uh, my gosh, um, residential schooling um, and the, you know, just the, the, the craziness around how indigenous peoples were treated um, and still treated in some cases. Uh, I'm having conversations with their parks and recreation department about you know, how they begin to think about conservation-based environmental justice. And I think part of what, you know, kind of their process, and you might definitely know more than I, than I know on this topic, is, you know, you know, what are the, the kind of principles and resolutions that, you know, have to allow those First Nation voices to be a part of these decisions? And, you know, and, and those decisions, again, raise, you know, raise from, you know, the parks and, you know, how the land is going to be used or not used. And so, you know, they're really thinking hard about that because of the, the high connectivity with First Nations in Metro Vancouver. But um, I feel like, you know, and again, with, with any initiative, with any policy, you know, like, again, those basic questions and kind of the equity analysis framework that I use, you know, those questions, you know, I think transcend whatever issue or problem. And just making sure again, that you have the, the right folks at the table in the room, that you understand where the disparities are happening and what's driving it. And one of the tools that I often use is just, you know, ask the question why six or seven times. You know, so if you're seeing something that's happening, 
really asking yourself why, 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 to really get down to that root cause. And, and then again, so whether it's conservation-based environmental justice or air quality issues and whatever, asking those questions is key and, and making sure that you have the right people in the room. So, so Gary, I'm probably then not satisfactory, but I am learning as I go every day. <laughs>